And um, yeah. So uh, welcome everybody, and uh, thank you for coming. <laughs> and you know, so uh, for me, this is the usual time to do these webinars. So I thought it's a bit unfair that <laughs> to be all alone <laughs> this time of the day. So I invited you all <laughs> here, and uh, thank you for coming. Um, and uh, so I send uh, my um, greetings to online uh, people as well. So uh, welcome all. Um, so here. Uh, in Lulio, so we have some 25, well, exactly 25 participants on the PSA uh, workshop, which uh, is going uh, great. So uh, I will make all the recordings available on Sunday. Uh, but uh, so this is a final session of BSA Online. Uh, so for this season, so spring season, I know that you don't like the screen because it's, <laughs> it's not. It's not, it's not <laughs> Pascal. You know. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I still couldn't come up with naming. Um, yes. Um, and uh, so what I, what can I say? First of all, it's great that we keep on doing this webinar uh, already three three years in a row. That's, uh, that's pretty fantastic. And uh, thank you for been interested. Uh, and uh, for this uh, session, so I plan pretty much the uh, same agenda as for the last uh, session of the previous season. So it's an open mic session. Uh, so uh, we don't have uh, presentations to, to, to run, but uh, we have an agenda. Um, and uh, well, again, I probably, uh, I assume that you all received uh, a link to the website. Uh, with a description of what uh, we call it here, a workshop challenge. Uh, so basically, the idea is to um, uh, discuss issues and challenges uh, around vector symbolic architectures being uh, a, a discipline, a scientific discipline uh, within a field of artificial intelligence. So how to, I mean, what, what's needed to be done to make it a discipline from different perspectives? And uh, again, um, since I, I will soon stop talking and uh, leave the floor to you, uh, but uh, just to recapitulate, so it seems that say uh, the area is uh, kind of um, get, uh, gaining a momentum. So we have lots of researchers. We have stable constellations in uh, uh, in different countries, and uh, and even so, uh, looking at the publications, so the, it feels that I mean groups start to compete with each other. Who is doing something close, which is good. And this is a, 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 the necessary prerequisite for the progress. Um, then plenty of PhD students are, uh, well, already quite many, maybe not plenty, but many PhD students being graduated, uh, focusing on BSA, uh, HGC. Um, um, new projects, um, high profile projects, academic projects start to uh, appear. So I hear that uh, people are uh, getting money for research, which is also great. However, uh, there are still uh, challenges uh, connected to BSA, to acceptance of BSA as a field or um, as a discipline. And you uh, face these challenges every time. Could you put it in the wrong place? Huh? Is there something wrong with this? I put it in the wrong place. No, I put it there. Why did you put it there? Uh, yeah. Okay. Here, uh, I, I, I uh, muted you for a moment. Uh, yes. Um, so the challenges. Uh, there are many. I, I, I will not uh, tell them all. Uh, but um, every time to write an article to uh, to um, a kind of a general scope um, journal or a magazine. Uh, every time you send a proposal, so people, so there are reviewers which are kind of, um, well, I have to admit there are uh, reviewers that become loyal to the VSA agenda, but uh, um, there are many reviewers uh, who are still skeptical about it, uh, for whom uh, VSA HGC is really something not mainstream, and uh, I mean, it takes lots of time to, to um, motivate and convince. So uh, this is one perspective. Uh, PhD students uh, producing good publications, having um, uh, cited, uh, been cited, you know, uh, um, which is a good academically, a good uh, indicator of the progress. 
uh, face uh, difficulties of selling themselves to um, uh, employers saying, okay, so I did PhD in um, HTC VSA. Uh -huh, so what, what, uh, <laughs> what does it mean? What can it do? <laughs> uh, practically, actually. And then it takes lots of time to convince that actually this uh, or something um, uh, viable. And uh, and then, uh, even if you have uh, managed to get a funding for a project, then try to find a um, you know a person uh, a personnel to, to work on this project. Uh, to try to find PhD students who become uh, kind of blocked by um, uh, keywords VSA. So we do, you will do research in VSA next three to five years. So okay. good luck with that. <laughs> So uh, it's hard to do that. So what's needed to make uh, VSA uh, an accepted discipline? So this is the topic for today's discussion. And at this uh, point, so I, I mute myself and I leave you, <laughs> uh, the floor to you. So uh, no specific order. So if you have something to say, just say. Yeah, uh, Tony. So uh, we, we start with the uh, local. Uh, do, do you have a mic you want to pass yeah, around? It, it, it's, 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 sensitive. it's sensitive okay. if you just yeah. speak up. With it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's, there's a ton of intriguing techniques, but I think what's really needed, it's sort of obvious, but we need a killer app. We need something that, that really, you know, demonstrates what what we can do using VSA, HTC, that the can't be done in, in other ways, you know, needs to add something. That's, true. that's true. Mike. True, true, a killer app. Yeah. Well, maybe somebody has, uh, has in mind the killer app already. <laughs> Can't he? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, they're fast. They can learn online, so probably something where you can literally, in in the span of a minute or so, as the data set is playing, learn and show the person like, look, I just did what would take on the whole network a very long time. And fast then uh, capabilities of online learning. Yes, uh, and by the way, so uh, uh, those of you joining us uh, online, so. Please uh, um, don't wait to be asked. So if you have something to say, just uh, unmute yourself and speak up. Well, I, I think the state of the art just looks at percentages, percentage correct. But I think somehow we have to measure the amount of energy that or computing that went into it. And, and I try to find something in, in our bag of tricks that can address at least the, the, the largest energy sinks or holes that the, the present systems. But, um, I, I hear estimates that, that if AI is going the way it's going, that, that soon it uses half the energy of, the, of, of electricity. And so. So, so I, I think that that's an that's a soft, very soft spot in the present AI. AI. So, so even if we just do what others do, when we do it with with 0.1 percent of the energy, and even if it's not the high scoring result, it still may be good enough to attract attention. Um. I, I agree. We've uh, we've been looking at the power required, and the uh, the amount is astronomical. In fact, it's uh, it's it's not going to work. Um, so moving forward, um, we've been looking at different types of memory that are persistent, um, but that that into itself. Uh, is is so problematical. It's 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 an enigma right now, but we're we're making headway. Um, we we chose something that was very hard, and we're it's because it isn't until you actually start working on a project that you realize what all the problems really are. And um, I'm, I'm wondering how many people know of a company up in Seattle, um, Pattern Computer. 
No, 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 not here. Um, Pattern Computer has been doing um, basically a, a version of um, a VSA, if you will, for at least since 2018. And they're online, they have a splash. And um, the reason they haven't done um, a splash recently is because they're too busy. And one of the things they said in their splash, the last, the fifth splash on uh, YouTube was um, about the domain is that you have to understand your data domain that um, you're using in order to um, actually do prediction. So these guys are actually in the prediction business of wellness. And recently we're seeing, um, we're seeing some of the uh, Moderna, for instance, if you look at their most recent commercial, um, they're talking about an mRNA platform. Now, what's happened in the Valley here is there's a company named Vicarious that split out of Numenta some years ago. And Vicarious, um, uh, Deepak George was uh, one of the founders of of the company, um, he got shanghai if you will, suborned um, to London and DeepMind. And they were the people that did uh, the um, Alpha Bend. The thing. So for Google, and he's now part of, uh, uh, I guess, DeepMind, but, um, he came from the HTM environment of um, hierarchical temporal memory, which uh, basically, I'm pretty sure Pinty knows all about this stuff, um, has been launched uh, by um, our friend, uh, both Subutai Ahmed and uh, Hawkins, Jeff Hawkins. Um, and they're 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 paired with Intel. I don't know how it's pretty deep, I guess. Um, so the the problem that we see from our perspective as analysts in, in the community, um, we see that um, you have the university class of people who uh, are in the learn mode, and then you have the, the industry people who are in the make the money mode. And then you have the startup people who are in the mode of breaking things and making new things or whatever it is this week. But it works out that the startup people make the highest impact on the market. That the that long-term impact is from the startup people. And where do most of the startup people come from? Um, well, it, it can be internal to large corporations. Is the, There's a, a saying in Silicon Valley that is always save your best ideas for your startup. In other words, don't, don't give it to the corporation, um, which is kind of interesting. The, the, the real point that I'm trying to make here is, is that um, you have to understand what is it that you're actually trying to do? What, what, what do you provide? And what we see as the, the best thing that can happen with VSA is it, predict, it predicts, it takes data and it predicts. And we, uh, we, we looked around and said, well, what's a really low cost way of predicting that has a high impact. And we, uh, we chose uh, to do real-time quantitative analysis. And that sounds prodigiously boastful, but, and, and as I was to learn, it was, but it's not so far from the capabilities of what we already have. And um, we've had some stops and fits of Intel getting out of a particular type of memory that we need, but we have some other others that are backup or 
they can suffice because we do need persistent memory in order to do what we have in plan. Um, so this is just some of uh, the ups and downs. We've also discovered that um, we run into some additional mathematics um, that are very handy in other areas, as a matter of fact. And uh, the uh, dynamical systems, for instance, is part of it, which is a real surprise, actually, because um, when I first started out a long time ago on this voyage, um, I thought that dynamical systems would be part and parcel. How many people have re read the book? Um, the uh, it's by Thomas Bass. And it's about the guys out of Santa Cruz who went down to Santa Fe and decided that they were going to predict the market. And, and it's called The Predictors. And it's a really interesting tale to read because it gives you a great insight of these guys didn't know anything about the financial markets when they began. But it gives you an interesting insight into what the problems they ran into along the way and the types of institutional mathematics that they were using um, in order to solve the problem. It worked out. Um, they became part of uh, UBS in finality out of from a Chicago point of view. And they were disbanded in 2018. So it's, it's great reading for people that like to know these things. Um, we also studied uh, Rentech or does everybody know what, who Rentech is? Jim Simons, guy publishes Quantum Magazine and that you know, gives money to uh, Sony, Stony Brook and uh, Cal Berkeley, no? Um, how about Renaissance Technology? He's the, he's the guy that's been turning out correct predictions on the market uh, for, I guess, less than 35 years now. And uh, it's uh, an extremely large quant, if you will. Um, we studied him and, and what where he came from. And, what occurred was, was that we were able to understand that we had a lot of other application areas that uh, we had no idea. Um, the, uh, the defense applications alone are enormous. <laughs> There's, it's, uh, a lot of uh, people have uh, basically been standing still. I was part of the cruise missile project in the 80s and 85 or so. And I look back on that with what this capability could do. And it's a virtual piece of cake. So what we're sadly lacking is actually um, what I call the hammer and tong capability by the blacksmith's forge. There's no practice of the art within the community. So that's the, that's the hard side. So basically, um, yeah, basically, what you're saying is, uh, I mean, we 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 lack tools. Uh, tools is a, uh, to be used by others for development. So that what uh, well, I, I, that session wasn't streamed, but I mean, this is something we're discussing here as well. So how to make yeah. it more accessible bite, by others? A bite magazine, if you will. A how to. Yeah. Um, and. Yeah. Do a, a simple, you know, prediction algorithm um, that can be run on Penke's ten-year-old PC. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, yeah. Um, maybe I um, want to pass uh, a word somewhere here in the audience, and uh, so in addition to um, maybe extend it a little bit from a killer app to. Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe we shouldn't uh, kind of uh, focus too much on kind of just selling VSA as the the uh, mm, 
panacea, uh, sort of, uh, that is capable of everything. But uh, so part of the items uh, I listed there is uh, um, relationship to, to other branches, like other technological uh, academic branches. Maybe we can, I mean, so what, what do you see? What, what kind of synergies uh, you see kind of more productive? Or uh, yes, uh, Kelly. Well, a lot of interest, at least in the U.S., has been on uh, multi-physics problems recently and kind of solving these high-energy high physics problems where you have uh, so many interdependent variables, which makes these computations extremely complex, and you tra traditionally have to run them on supercomputers for weeks at a time. And so yeah. there's a lot of interest in kind of solving these highly complex superimposed problems. So naturally HDC seems like a great fit for that because again, you're working in the superimposed space and you can have these um, uh, higher dimensional states that represent complex, like a really common issue in this field is kind of you have some input state with a certain setup. A lot of this is for uh, laser plasma accelerators. So you have this set of variables in terms of pressure, temperature, um, you know, laser setup, whatever. Um, and then you're looking for an end state in terms of the velocities present in the plasma and like the various patterns. And so obviously like HDC is a great fit for something like this where we can have these um, various mappings and such and then do such a superimposed problem. Whereas with neural networks, you're really confined um, to the input. Like if you were to say like, I have an input with all of these different features of interest, that's not something you can easily feed into say like a deep learning network. So I think something like that HDC could, you know, make a lot of impact in, um, and some of these, again, like superimposed problems that are hard to kind of format for more traditional machine learning methods. That's interesting. So today, for example, I mean, uh, among the talks that we uh, heard, uh, I, uh, it's uh, Kenny that um, um, probably presented kind of interesting use case. Um, but I mean, I, I'm just wondering if in the audience, I mean, who else is kind of, uh, uh, you know, actively thinking about computing in superposition? And yes, well, you, in which context then? Computing dynamical systems. Okay. Predicting dynam dynamical systems. Okay, yep. uh, interesting. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I like the um, kind of this link to um, uh, this. Yeah. I mean, in, in Sweden, there is this, I think maybe not, not only in Sweden, but we, we have this big science um, initiative. So it's like, uh, basically, the, the, I agree. There is a great focus on uh, fundamental uh, research questions and uh, facilitating computing. But uh, I don't think, uh, at least I didn't see any any kind of um, real examples of people applying HDC to this uh, kind of use cases. I don't know. Did you do you have anything on top of your head? UC Irvine um, is doing a lot of work on this. I know because they do a lot on the algorithm side, so they kind of look at these complex encodings mm -hmm. um, where you're working with something more than a binary vector can handle. Like, I know they work with a lot of complex valued hyper vectors and stuff like that. And then additionally, you have um, kind of the combination with neural network encodings. So for a lot of data sets, um, you know, Im images is kind of the simplest example, but it's most effective when you have a layer of feature abstraction um, or extraction rather on top of just like, you know, say a pure pixel valued mapping, you do better with something like a neural network in between, like with very few layers that does some kind of um, learning on the input and then maps it to HD space. So you kind of learn the projection function. Um, so they do some work there with these more, again, kind of like abstract inputs um, that allows you to kind of make more use of the input data. Um, but yeah, coming, this is like, 
pretty new to me. I'm again a, a binary hypervector person, so <laughs> I uh, I can't speak too much on this. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Chris. Oh, yeah, just kind of as a comment or a follow up to some of these kind of discussions. I think one area that's like, um, I think really exciting or worth worth like uh, thinking about is not just like okay, where are HD algorithms like different um, from I get other kinds of machine learning methods, but also what are the similarities? And then where there are similarities, what might be advantages or differences in terms of like implementation or algorithms? Um, so just as a kind of concrete example of this, and I think I'd be happy to talk to folks more about this. Uh, there's been a lot of interesting work connecting uh, different kinds of kernel methods. Um, yeah, that are kind of just standard bread and butter, um, like very popular in machine learning some time ago before a lot of like neural network stuff. Um, yeah, or, I mean, it goes back and forth, right? But um, yeah, there's a lot of ways in which um, a lot of HD methods are approximating uh, particular kernel algorithms. And if that's true, then they should have similar strengths in certain cases, but then um, may have other advantages, um, like just kind of having a holographic structure or being robust. Um, but in addition to that, I think an additional kind of application is designing algorithms um, that are taking advantage of, I guess, dynamics uh, with computing and superposition, um, because then this is an area where um, I think there's not really the best ideas or, of how to do this. So um, like, I think one example of this that I've been thinking a lot about um, is my own bias is like resonator network in comparison to like other kinds of uh, methods where you uh, solve things via like gradient descent, um, where it seems like at least in the space of um, trying to search for what kind of pairs or what kinds of uh, factors are entangled together. Uh, there can be a lot of local minima in the gradient space um, that you can get around by searching a zoom position. And I think that's probably not the only example I would have surprised if it were. And I think, um, yeah, it's on us to maybe think about what kinds of examples there are of other dynamical systems. Um, yeah, or even like analyzing ones like in reservoir computing, for example, um, as kinds of um, extensions of VSA models. Um, all right. Um, yeah, yeah, Alex. Um, I think that the, if the objective is to grow the field and bring it to the forefront of attention, the solution will not be entirely technical, at least. So we are talking a lot about you can do it, etc. cetera, uh, cases. Um, but uh, again, maybe it's a combination of the fact that I am not so deeply entwined with this community and also. Uh, I have to talk to policy people and things like that, but watching the discussion uh, for a policymaker or someone making funding decisions, this is way So I think that in order to connect with the community and including the broader community, you do not necessarily have deep enough technical understanding to understand the specifics of what we're doing here. And there are a few ingredients in your recipe that we could follow. So would be, one would be the right, perhaps, all of us as a community, a position paper, and aim for a high impact journal and say, this is the time, this is a perspective where we think things are going and then connect it to existing work, which uh, maybe people don't realize is, uh, is VSA. So, for example, the famous paper from IBM is for me, an example of VSA that connection has to be explicit. We have to articulate clearly the technical, the high level, top level technical benefits, like how this can outperform very deep neural networks in performance, etc. And with our position, this is what it is. So define it as the field, give examples of where it's already been done, but maybe all of this wasn't connected in people's mind. Make the connection and say, all of these things, guys, are VSAs. You know, the connection is an umbrella for this. And then basically, the next ingredient is for us to go and uh, first of all collaborate with lots of projects and say here's an element we can call it different things uh coin the term use it when you write proposals use it when you write and define it i should know i've, I've spent the last 10 years defining what the memory study is in most of the papers that i've written about the subject because i cannot expect the community to know what it is and second if you have access to uh, any funding agencies or policy bodies talk to them about that. So, for example, certain funding agencies of the UK are uh, this field is now on the radar as a thing, and they are doing scoping exercises. Okay, what does this mean for the UK? 
And I suspect, although I can't prove it, that, that probably becomes a conversation player for them. It's really important to connect with the right people and talk to them to the right level. Yeah. So, um, um, but uh, does it mean that we need maybe to come up with a less technical term? Like, I mean, in the, compared to uh, or uh, analogously to deep learning, something something that is easily understandable, like, uh, well, I'm just speculating wide learning or whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, in interesting perspective. Um, so, did you? I, and when you when you talked about that uh, sort of basically about the need to to do better marketing um, yeah that that recent paper in quanta magazine that i thought was a, a really nice exposition of it did you see that okay okay mm. but yeah i would have been interested on your in your perspective on that paper but... it was it was reprinted in wired by the way that's an indicator <laughs> okay okay interesting mm -hmm. I mean, I think personally, as just as an outsider to the community, like as somebody who's approaching this community as an outsider, something that would stand out is the low energy. I mean, I think if there's going to be like one thing we're going to drive home with people, getting back to Alexander's talk earlier today about how costly, just in terms of pollution, energy, you know, budget goes to these massive data centers and training these deep neural networks um when we when we present something like one shot learning i think that alone is enough to say you know hey this is big like selling it to funding agencies i mean i think that's a, a big thing to lead with and something that you know you don't need to know any technical details about to become very, very interested quickly. And maybe just connected to what you said, uh, just an open question. I mean, but uh, shouldn't we uh, try to kind of better position us with respect to say deep learning? So which everybody understands what it is. I should say that's, yeah, I don't know, in one way or another. Positioning is important. So just to add to both of those, the way I've been trying to promote this approach uh, in the UK is the kind of holy trinity. Let me see if I remember the whole thing. But is that if you go vector symbolic, it's going to be fast to train. And so one shot or zero shot or all that kind of stuff, it's going to be auditable, which is very important when you're trying to certify something. And because you are training very efficiently and, and it's transparent and all of that, it will always be low power. So those are three of the most important things that people I work with are interested in. So at that level, you can say, Here's a compelling case, literally in two pages, mm. where we're very simple. We are in business. Just on the uh, yeah, yeah, sure. That's uh, the energy argument. Has there been experiences with journals and reviewers, so we can understand the other side of that coin? Has anyone had experiences where? The energy argument was put forth, but it was knocked back because performance was not okay. Yeah, yeah. The semiconductor industry is wrestling with it in the Joint Electron Device Engineering Council, or JEDIC, which is the standard organization for memory. And um, they know the question, and, and they know it's that it's exponential power use uh, that deep learning will not work the way it's going. There's no, there's absolutely no way. But what are they going to do in order to uh, substitute an item that will do well? And there's uh, the Nanteros NRAM, as they call it, and that's uh, uses the carbon fiber. Um, and yeah, so yeah, yeah, they. Yeah, what I'm getting at here is, is, yeah, they know the question, but it's not it's not been popularized. Um, the memory industry is dealing with the shutdown of their sales um, because the 5.8 question, and the 5.8 question is, is that a lot of the large scalar um, cloud-based systems are now decided to go from five years replacement on their memory to eight years. So all of a sudden, uh, their sales are not only uh, 
affected by uh, what is the tech recession, you'll feel it, don't worry, um, will be uh, now cut by five eighths. And that, uh, that's got them really in a, in a problem right now. So they're, they're cutting back on their R and D is what's happening. Okay. Um, if I if I may uh, maybe change the topic a little bit, so just uh, because we have some other uh, items to to talk about. Um, uh, so talking about um, um, educating people, uh, like uh, postgraduate educa education, so uh, so letting people do a PhD in this uh, stuff. So what kind of skills we actually uh, um, train? Uh, and such people. So how do we, uh, I mean, what, what is the selling point to younger generation researchers and how we can make this field attractive? I mean, so yeah, I, I guess many of you are uh, supervisors to PhD students. So how would you- Besides the killer app. <laughs> yeah, yeah, besides the killer app, yes, absolutely. You put a bundle with something that will attract people. Say again? Bundle it with something that will attract people. So that's one of the best ways to get into, into any, whether you know, I'll be very honest and, and say that um, when I started my academic career, we, I, I entered a group which was new, completely new. So we didn't exist and we came into being basically, and I was one of the first covers. So getting to the point where we were publishing what I call luxury journals, like Nature Group, etc., the way to get in there is to go with someone who's done it before. So bundling it with something that is massively popular and saying you're going to do this mm. disciplinary thing plays well with funders, plays well with the students, and then you can get your job done. That's one of the most successful techniques that I can do. I mean, I, I would say just like on the other side, um, I kind of stumbled onto HDC and what really drew me into it was seeing how kind of beautifully simple it is, you know, like it's not all of this entrenched methodology. It really is kind of like the space itself does the computing for you. And you have fo so few operators, the algorithms are so simple. It really is, but it's still so powerful. And so that's kind of the crazy thing. And for me, that was really like, what totally drew me into it was just kind of seeing again, like how simple it was. I was like, this has to be, you know, nature kind of over evolution just finds this minimum for kind of how to do things the most efficiently. And so I just, for me, I was like, this has to be, it just kind of struck home with like, I actually read Penty's uh, SDM, the book. And so uh, reading a lot of that math, like and coming from a bio background, that was just like really resonant with a lot of theories kind of about how bio signaling happens and how learning happens in a biological model. And so kind of all of those parallels really were a, a drawing force for me. So I think, I mean, even though it's been growing in popularity, I think, again, so few people know about it. So I think a big part of marketing will be getting the word out. Um, and again, like AI has been on the rise. Uh, neuromorphic computing has been on the rise. So I think, you know, perhaps like a, a group letter of interest, a high impact journal, like maybe that would be a good way to advertise or, um, you know, I, I don't know, something that would reach perhaps like a, a, a broader range in the CS community um, and, and neuroscience as well. Cause again, like I, I came in from a bio background and I think that's, I think there could be a lot of people again, like in bio or in related fields who could be drawn over to our side. Um, Cause it is such an interdisciplinary field. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's my two cents. <laughs> Well, I, I feel it would be very good to have some hardcore mathematicians, statisticians, and computer scientists just get them interested in actually looking at the deeper problems, mathematical problems. There's one thing that, that sort of troubles me right now. I would sort of be worried to educate, let's say, a PhD student just on, in this area because there really are no jobs. I mean, if, if, if you're doing deep learning, you have jobs, but if, if you're doing something that 
is not already established, mm. you sort of you sort of have to <laughs> have to tolerate some pain. And so so would you recommend somebody to go and get educated in this area? I would love to, but at the same time, I would be afraid to. You know, I, I'm not doing the best service to the person who is who's sort of looking looking ahead. Even you know, over ten years, ten things will be different ten years from now. I'm quite I'm quite certain of that. But at this moment, absolutely, we sort of have to be careful. Uh, maybe I, I, I mean, I let Joshua to read his text, uh, not uh, uh, me just uh, localizing what he uh, wrote. Uh, what, what did, uh, what was looking for you as a PhD student to become a PhD student? Sorry. Maybe Joshua doesn't have a, a mic no, maybe. working. Oh, okay. maybe you could just uh, Sorry, sorry, I'm here now. <laughs> I'm not, I just haven't been able to find a quiet place, I'm afraid. Oh, um, okay. So, uh, sorry, I can do a camera too. Um, I uh, I always feel a little bit cautious that I'm going to um, you know, uh, say something clumsy. So I think probably the thing to do is to just say something clumsy. Um, I think one thing about um, HD computing is it's harder than deep learning. And that's not to um it's harder in the sense that it, to see the full capabilities of a system that's built on structured algebra you have to understand a lot more math than basically two semesters of calculus and a watered down differential equations class which is enough to actually go really far in deep learning and that's not meant to say you know the deep learning community is a bunch of dummies that's not what i mean at all i i just mean um it's a it's a different tool, and I think probably there's merit in treating it like a different tool. Um, and, and so I I'm um, I understand uh, to get back to the energy arguments. I understand the the merits of those arguments, but they, they always strike me as a bit strange because it seems like um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. It's, you know, it's like if you had a, um, a, a two Michelin star restaurant and you said. Oh, we can we can cut you a deal on dinner. It's going to be twenty percent cheaper than McDonald's, and I think well, that that seems strange. It's that may be true, but you have better selling points than that. And it seems to me that HD computing has these magical powers, um, you know, to 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 uh, to rip to rip a quote from my advisor. It has these um, meta magical powers or these mathematical powers, um, and I uh, I think that's probably what we ought to, or not necessarily the only thing we should focus on, but I think it's it is something we should focus on. Uh, one of the things that got me excited initially was Ross's work on analogies. I think um, this is a system yeah. that's that's well suited to doing the really important parts of thinking in a way that deep learning models, um, I think kind of struggle to. It's not that they can't do it. It's that I think they take a very roundabout way. I mean, you, you know, you could you could take an integral by coming up with a, a bunch of fancy fancy repetitive sums of of one over and over and over again, or you could do something a little more sophisticated. It seems to me that um, our architecture is is that more sophisticated approach, right? I mean, you, you you can sort of do calculus by counting squares on graph paper, or you can do it by doing calculus. I feel like we have the capacity to do calculus, so go get them. So John, right, that's, that's, that was that was that was longer winded than I meant to be. So I'll shut up now. Well, Joshua, in that that's an interesting perspective. Not sure I agree with it. You're, you, I can't read all of your comment there, but I thought you you expressed something really important there in your comment as well. One wonder if you could read that out. We're in the meeting room. Your comment on the screen is pretty it's, small. Yeah, it's, pretty, it's small. It's in the middle and if you could just read out your comment, that would be great. My uh, my connection broke, so I, I'll have to try to reconstruct my comment oh. from. I'll, I'll try to I'll try to dredge it up from memory, but it's recent memory, so I, I should can you read, maybe can you I'll be okay. Can you read the yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll read it out. Uh, so you know oh, what said. It's, thank, uh, thank you for that, Ross. There's uh, what, well, two comments. You had an earlier one, which was shorter, which was saying that 
uh, transparency and explainability uh, seem to you like a big advantage. And I think that uh, probably uh, uh, chimed with uh, Alex's point about uh, auditability in his Holy Trinity. Uh, the more extensive um, comment is, uh, what grabbed me about the VSA relative to deep learning is that I quickly concluded it could do things deep learning either wouldn't be able to, or at least wouldn't practically. Uh, that seems to me a bigger selling point than energy savings. Uh, I Surprisingly, I, I agree with me. <laughs> yeah. uh, Peter. If I could just give a suggestion that maybe put a pretty big nail in all this. Um, perhaps it's not a good idea to come to somebody and say, ah, I can do better than this or whatever, because you're sort of like a, a used car salesman. You're like, ah, this don't don't look at this, look at this, right? It's it's better in this way. Uh, and if the goal is to attract new people to the field, I think it's much better to take your new PhD student and say, look, here's a very simple benchmark algorithm. It's called hyperdimensional computing. Don't worry about the details. Uh, but this is how well it does in this amount of time, with this amount of resources. I want you to do better than this in the same amount of time. You're free to do whatever you want, but we need to beat this benchmark. And the more they work on it, the more they'll see how difficult that will be. That's how you spark interest hmm. pursuing it. Then you can like the details of what it is. Maybe you can do this better by looking at the fundamentals of the algorithm, trying to improve on that. So just a, a food for thought, I guess. I think in the learning especially, um, like one shot learning. I mean, there's just nothing else really like HTC that I feel like can yeah. compete on that level in terms of you training examples needed. Right, right. Yeah, I agree about um, compositionality, I think, but that's a much harder thing to explain to people. Mm -hmm. So the interesting thing about the message is that its ability to propagate does not only depend on the clarity of thought of the messenger, but also the ability of the receiver to accept it. And we have to adjust ourselves to that. That's one quick point. And on the second one, you know, someone who is semi external to the community, uh, I think there has to be a lot more um, acknowledgement that basically this community is sitting on gold mines, which level of, of, of appeals. So, as someone who has contact with hardware and with uh, standard machine learning and all of that, I think that if there, there are significant opportunities that I see in combining PSAs with ML, uh, more traditional ML, and with hardware architectures, and specifically uh, those very long instruction uh, <laughs> computers. So again, if there is a bundling, and if you tell the students that you will learn how to use PyTorch and things like that, yeah. plus something magical, which is our secret sauce, or to the hardware people that you learn to use standard tools, be they have tools for design affairs or the standard tool for FPGAs, etc. Those are extremely sought after in industries, plus our secret sauce. That is a very close top tail. It is truly a gold mine. I sincerely believe that. Yeah, you, you know, you, you could, um, we could try to pose HDP as a sort of like a, like a basic tool for the field like think of think of one of the things people study most like let's say let's take the fast forward transport for example it's still being it's still being applied it's still being used everywhere spectrum methods and neural networks and all that there's still interest in it why it's because it's such a fundamental thing in your tool set for research that it's the thing you gravitate to first when you try any new solutions any new problem so perhaps we want to and in the, in the, in the, as far as like, so that companies are interested in hiring such uh, students in, the, in HDC or in terms of funding and stuff like that, perhaps better to uh, pose this as like an absolutely essential thing that every person who works in AI should know this because it might be useful for any kind of problem they would encounter. If the graduate can articulate that, yeah, that's an extremely powerful. But then they go to the employer and say, you know, 
Okay, or show all these plus look at this. Yeah, yeah. And in my experience, that's when industry started listening. Yeah, when they don't show that when you articulate that I think I have a game changer. I think this is summarizing what I've been hearing, then there's there's really two threads to what's been said. Uh, there's it's a form and a content thread. Um, and the, the form part, paraphrasing Alex, is essentially a discipline exists if people exist, if enough people believe it exists. So the deal is to talk as though it does loudly and often, and effectively it will. Um, and then the rest of the content stuff is what do you need to put into that message in order you know, that's sufficiently attractive. So you know, you had your position paper in the high impact journal. So that that's that's talking to one audience, whereas this other, what what would make it attractive to graduate students and so on is is another yeah. another separate audience. But so in that that seems to me to be the fundamental breakup here. It's your primary primary thing is. Pretend it exists, but say it very loudly to as many people as possible. And then the second part is what's the content in order so that it actually gets in somebody's ear and brain. Uh, Tony. Yeah. So yeah, kind of interesting stuff came up. The what the the one thing that I see as the as the primary killer app, and a number a number of people mentioned this as well, is the is the transparency and explainability. Because that's a that's a huge problem with huge it, problem. with yeah. existing AI that you know with basically you know with transformer networks and the large language models is they do amazing things, but they also do amazing screw ups yeah. and nobody understands why. And this this comes back to the simplicity of of the. Um, you know, VSA approaches that, that we can totally understand how they're yeah. doing binding because it's just, you know, element-wise multiplication or XOR yeah. or, you know, circular yeah. convolution or whatever you want to do. We can, un we can understand that. So the, and if you can, I think the, the energy, the energy aspect is also super interesting, but I haven't yet seen mm. your know, realizations of hardware. So, mm. so it remains sort of a tantalizing possibility. And that, that was something that came out really strongly in the quantum article that I really liked about it. But you know, I'd, I'd love to see that actually demonstrated. Yeah. I, I, I hear I totally agree. Yes, it would be really so, cool to see this. Yeah, uh, yeah. But the but the explainability and and actually and I think like like Gil said, you know, I I, I loved his characterization of um, industry and and you know in in academia people are in a learning mode in industry, very much an exploit mode, and and you know it's we. We need to, and and what I see, I'm I'm working at Google, and and people are, you know, totally entrenched with transformer networks and using them for everything, and they're working pretty well. That's the transformers have become that like basic thing in your tool set now. They they are, and, and they chat yeah, GPT yeah, is yeah. quickly becoming that as well. Yeah, even for anyone like yeah, I for the solar class I take the students. Are literally writing their code in chat gpt yeah. and then they tell chat gpt i need you to change this functionality and we'll let it do that and then they just copy paste it. that's how fundamentally important hmm. chat gpt has become so i think back to the call you know you need some like you need you need to pose hdc as like a essential thing in your toolkit hmm. uh those are really the things that endure oh well, mm -hmm. The GP chat GPT will endure, but that's how they got in this moment. Wow. Yeah, Sam Altman said that basically they're not working on GPT 5 now, they, they stopped. Um, and that uh, GP that GPT 4 is not going to um, basically be the end all. He said basically it's not going to work. And his quote is, it will be something different, something new. And I'm not sure everybody read that. I think it was in the Wall Street Journal. I'll send it to Jenny so he can 
I yep. have it copied. All right, yep. I'll send it to you. It's okay. really. They okay, said, "Holy it. smoke!" <laughs> the inventor trashes his own product. My goodness, when does that happen? Um, it means that Dalton's probably an honest man. Uh, I, <laughs> Jeff Hinton has made a reversal too. You know. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. I actually, I, I'm now uh, starting to uh, look at my talks. Uh, uh, I have one more, uh, well, one item uh, on my list which I want to bring up for discussion, and it's about uh, um, outreach activities. So, I mean, uh, we partially touched upon this issue, but I mean, uh, what do you see as important um, communication channels? I mean, how practically should we promote uh, this area uh, beyond, for example, I mean, this um, events that we have for the community. So what else is needed? Uh, maybe uh, here we can be specific. So maybe we need to go to this and this and that conference and uh, uh, be present there. Uh, uh, to, to, to have some so, could I volunteer a thought? Sure, sure. Go on. Um, on the se seizing on the transparency angle, do we have any point of view on how some of the um, original deep learning proponents, like Joshua Benjo or Hinton or, or any of those folks, um, what their point of view would be on the relative risks of using something like an HD architecture versus a deep learning architecture, um, both in terms of transparency and safety, because I'm not saying um, they're the the um, sole and complete kingmakers of the world, but um, it, it would be interesting um, to get a sense of what of what kind of buy-in um, or not um, there would be from folks who. It, it, I guess what I'm trying to say is, if you could demonstrate that there are people who are well steeped in the field who say I have concerns about transformer models that I don't have in the same way about. HD models, or I have um, misgivings about the approach that I don't have um, about the HD approach, or I think there are capabilities in the HD approach. You know, it's um, I I think everyone in this room feels very strongly um, about the capabilities, but I think it's a little bit different when you have someone who's sort of come from a different team and then says, "Oh, yes, I see the merits, I see the capabilities." Um, so I'm just, I'm just curious. I don't actually, I don't, I don't know Jeff. I don't know Yashua. Um, I don't have a sense of, of what their responses would be. Um, I also don't know Jan Lacoon, who's on the sort of on the other side of the field, what his point of view would be. But I'm just curious because it's um, clearly it's not the case that those folks aren't aware of of this approach. I'm just curious what their points of view are on it relative to their more um, sort of bread and butter, historic, what made them famous. From, from my side, I, I, I must admit that it, it will be very, very tricky to invite one of them to these online webinars, I guess. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. So, any opinion on that uh, matter? You, you've got so any strategy you, when you say, attacking the dog one? Yeah, I, I mean, basically well. saying, I mean, basically saying there's something that people are concerned about, and you know, rather than um, wringing our hands permanently, it, it would be good to wring our hands for a little while and then think up different ways of kind of approaching what we think are the problems. And, you know, one approach is just a, a stop dead in our tracks and not do anything. Um, and some people might advocate for that. Um, and another approach is um, sort of redirect a little bit um, into a kind of more comfortable or, or higher confidence direction. Mm -hmm. Okay. One one thing is that we have uh, we've we've discovered over and over again is we like the word similarity, and uh, similarity is uh, basically a very big deal on VSA. In fact, it's uh, it's actually how um, Amazon sold books. But they didn't realize it at the time it was similarity, and they weren't using VSA. But uh, it came out of uh, Deck West in Palo Alto, and it, it's a long story. So um, there's a, there is a history behind similarity, 
and it, it goes to the heart of, of how the actual mathematics works. And similarity is an ex extremely valuable tool. And it's a lot easier to say similarity than it is to actually say, well, it's because of this and this and this. It's, you can say it's highly similar. It's like saying highly predictable. So it's that type of wording that we have to kind of break down um, the way that we're approaching our own patois and, and keeping us from communicating makes with sense. the general public. Yeah, makes sense, yes. Please. Yeah, um, I guess two thoughts, and then the second more directly answers the, I guess, your prompt about outreach. Um, one is that I think the reasons why we can desire transparency um, come for at least two reasons. One might be uh, kind of AI safety. Um, can we trust a particular system for a particular sensitive application kind of setting? Um, but I think a second one is that um, one motivated by like cognitive science and one which I see is kind of uh, some of the earlier motivations of things like sparse distributed memory or like early kind of work on like analogy or like part whole hierarchies that we talked about uh, today. And I think like in terms of like, yeah, I agree with Ross's distinction about content and form kind of motivations. And I think um, I agree with a lot of the form mo motivations, but I think the fact that we have a lot of different motivations, whether it's on the hardware end or solving kinds of interesting problems about how, yeah, um, the brain works and how we can understand it at maybe a higher level of abstraction or something like that might be things that appeal to, um, yeah, a different set of people. Um, and so, um, or at least those are the questions that like uh, got me kind of into the field or got me really kind of interested. And I think there's also a clear path to say like, it would be a very disappointing answer if all we learned about the brain was that if we have a network that, yeah, read the whole internet, um, then we can have predictions that are like the brain. I mean, it's almost like we had one box, black box that replaced another. Um, and I know people try to work on like interpretability points, but I mean, I think that's one that even someone who thinks like, oh, the deep learning thing is like working well, like, yeah, would see is like um, kind of an issue or, you know, a point um, that can be clearly uh, made as we should aspire to transparency or aspire to something better um, because we should think that that's possible. We're able to explain and justify our kinds of, yeah, actions and reasons for doing things, um, even though it's not fully transparent and make mistakes. Um, so with that said, like, I think it might be worthwhile, like, so now the second part is to like think through, like, what are the different motivations? I mean, like Dennis has a nice list of like, yeah, um, people in the community working on different kinds of projects and thinking about, okay, how can we use uh, the skills of like, yeah, everyone in the room and in the community, uh, what kinds of problems are people interested in working in and how, like, maybe we're not going to make a pitch to like every single person and go like, okay, you should join BSA, but like, um, what reasons like, yeah, do each of us hold as being like the most interesting parts of like why we're kind of in this field or doing the things that we're doing? And what's the pitch that we personally can make to another person? It's like, okay, I'm spending my time on this. I think you should as well. Um, because I think that might um, be maybe a more effective strategy, at least locally, than trying to figure out, okay, what's the general pitch, the most general audience, even though, of course, for like funding agencies and practical purposes, I mean, yeah, try that too, of course. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and here just, uh, I, I think um, maybe a uh, very quick note on what you said, uh, connected to what I started this uh, workshop uh, with, I mean, the request that I did uh, about hashtags. Uh, yeah, actually, it's a good point, you know, like per, uh, personal context, like spreading the, um, uh, you know, good words, uh, I mean, in different contexts and uh, and we, we, we have tools. I mean, we, uh, actually, I, I just, um, um, again, uh, connected to, to this. Uh, so uh, last uh, December, so we tried this uh, hybrid um, a hybrid event uh, in Melbourne. So when uh, when we invited people, you know, from uh, all around the, the world just to connect online. So basically, I mean, this uh, outreach activities can be nomadic. So if you go somewhere, you may ask, people from the community to join i mean one or two people you know to give some short talks or whatever so to make a big event or something i mean that might be useful and interesting and of course spread the word along your contact nets maybe yeah. a, a short reflection 
from me. Uh, I have heard uh, two points of attraction, of potential attraction to HDC VSA. It's uh, some killer application and, and some nature publication. Yeah. Maybe there, these are connected, uh, and you know, hopefully in some degree. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that outreach and uh, both outreach and inreach activity would benefit uh, from uh, uh, just enumeration, mm -hmm. those uh, potentially useful, if not killer applications. And for example, uh, connected with explainability and transparency, mm -hmm. but uh, 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 actually <clears throat> when uh, such application appears, uh, I think it it probably could be improved with uh, within various HDC VSA uh, approaches and uh, potentially read uh, lead to more powerful results and and more in publications and earlier applications. But maybe this is some competition. Mm. But maybe cooperation mm -hmm. on on such applications would be advantageous. Actually, I agree. Yes, I mean we are a small community. So and I mentioned in the beginning. So I, I mean I don't know. Maybe uh, I I hope you all perceive this. So there, there are some uh, there is a competition even within this community on publishing. You know, uh, doing some stuff. But uh, maybe it's time to start uh, or thinking about more uh, collaborative stuff. I don't know, sharing ideas and uh, you know involving each other. I don't know. Um, can, can I, yeah. Yeah, can I sure. just say something about, about our experience in the UK? We, we, we're getting quite a lot of interest uh, in VSA. And, and the, the selling yeah. message is, uh, you've got to remember, I, my background was with IBM Research. Yeah. IBM Research have made a very uh, important statement about their Memrista technology. They've said that HDC is the killer application for the Memrista technology, okay? That's a state. Now, IBM don't make statements like that normally, um, but but Geethan and, and Abbas Rahimi um, have, made, have actually made that statement in an IBM publication. So that, that's something we should push because there's a lot of interest in, in memory processing as part of the neuromorphic package. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is um, the, the work that Paxson's doing with, with Lava VSA is also generating interest because people are interested in neuromorphics. And if, if we can make Lava VSA a success, um, that will actually sell a lot of our ideas. So actually encouraging PhD students to think about neuromorphic processing and you know, aimed at something like the, the Intel range of, of neuromorphic processes is going to be of interest. And the third thing I'd say is that the way that we sell the VSA is that everything is a vector, whether you're talking about large language models, whether you're talking about uh, uh, convolutional neural networks, the layers in these deep networks are vectors. And one of the things that we are able to do is very easily convert those into common representation, hypervectors, and we can combine them together. And you can do all sorts of stuff. And we're doing lots of things at the moment, I've got a PhD student at Cardiff who's looking at uh, uh, the, the, the large language models, uh, taking the BERT layers, converting them to hypervectors, and we're doing all sorts of things with outlier detection, or, uh, all, all sorts of interesting stuff. So that the, the message is, it's about vectors of vectors. If you get that across, it's really important. And one area that 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 uh, I'm particularly interested in with the neuromorphic processing is nobody's really thinking about how you run a program on a neuromorphic device. Mm -hmm. People are just thinking about building convolutional networks and doing all the standard stuff. But how do you do computation? And because you combine or bundle vectors together, the vectors themselves can be the instructions in your program. So if those, if those patterns of spikes, which you can do with slot encoding, become the program, you've got a way of actually running a program on a neuromorphic device. So there's lots of interesting areas there. And we've just got, um, well, we, 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 we just received a request for proposal for about half a million pounds, which doesn't sound a lot, but it, it is 
you know, people are putting their money where their mouth is. And, and uh, so uh, I, I think that it's, it's, it's selling the idea. And I always go back to Chris Elias Smith's uh, picture for the semantic pointer architecture. The vector is both the concept and a pointer to the concept. And if you get your head around what he's saying, that's really powerful. And it, all these large language models and all the other things are semantic vector spaces, and we're dealing with semantic vector spaces. I, I think Tony was the first to want to verbalize that. Yeah. He, okay. Yeah. 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 Well, Chris is a, Chris is better at promoting himself than Tony is. <laughs> 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 yeah, Tony has a new office and better clothes. <laughs> oh, I like it. I mean, listen, He's so, discovered. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, on this positive note, I think uh, so time is uh, running fast. So it's quarter past uh, uh, 11 now in here in Sweden. Uh, yeah, it's about sunset and sunrise at the same time. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, so thank you very much for joining this last session of PSA Online. So the um, uh, first session of the next season, uh, so um, do expect in the first week of September, so uh, approximately, but I, I will um, I will send a message uh, in the list. And if you have in mind uh, a presentation, so drop me a line, so I will schedule it for you. All right. Uh, thank you all online and thank you all here uh, physically. So thank you and goodbye. Yeah. Well, Bye. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, although the workshop continues, I will not have the opportunity to talk like this. Uh, um, Evgeny really deserves our appreciation for the organization. Thank you. So now I turn around. Dennis, yeah. Dennis has helped, and I, <laughs> I, I, I think Dimitri has helped, and I don't know who else, but. But I, I think that's that's wonderful that you you have gone into all that trouble. You didn't have you hardly had time to do your own represent presentations, but <laughs> but you got all will, they, they will come. They will come. All right. Thank yeah. you all. Thank here, you. Here. Yeah. Bye. Have a good summer. Yes. Enjoy your summer. <laughs>